You know, I love the food and wine. I love the, the intensity. I love the middle of service. It's still, you know, that two hours of a night time where you're just on the edge of your seat and you're just keeping it just under control is still probably my happiest time because that's all I'm thinking about. And I, all the other things in my life get pushed to the back of my head for that couple of hours. And I still get a lot of joy out of that. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. The release of all the latest guides and awards have shone a light on the wave of Japanese venues to open in Australia and the influence the cuisine is having. But there are some operators that have helped open the door for the last few decades and paved the way for others to follow. Simon Denton is the owner of Kakuuchi and Izakaya Den. Simon, how are you? Very well, Anthony. Good to speak to you. It's good to get you on the show. Um, you've got a brand new venue, even though you've been doing this for quite some time now. Tell us a bit about it. So um, where we are in uh, at Izakai Den, corner of Russell and Little Collins, we've had a, an upstairs neighbour for, for the, the whole time we've been there. It's a cafe called Postal Hall. And it's actually, it's a pr- pretty old place. And uh, one of the Melbourne stalwarts, probably been there 25 years. And um, we've always had a really good relationship with them. But obviously, it's only a daytime business. And, and especially sort of post-COVID, as the city sort of goes through recovery, um, I sort of came up with a concept where we could share the space. So essentially for summer, as a starting point, we're, we're taking over the space Friday and Saturday nights and doing a, a casual Japanese bar called Kakuuchi. And uh, Kakuuchi means sort of on the corner or on the corner bar. And they sort of, um, you m- mostly find them in Fukuoka. Um, and they're just local places. They're watering holes. They're, they're for the workers. They're for, you know, the local, whoever's living around the corner sort of thing. And, and that's the idea that we want to do. And we sort of want to engage the street level. I mean, Izakai Den is a, is a hidden basement. And, you know, with the, all the changes that have happened the way the city is, we just felt we needed to engage the street a little bit. How are things in, in Melbourne at the moment? The, the, Melbourne got it pretty tough. Look, it's a challenge. Uh, and I think everyone would say, you know, there's good and there's ups and downs. I mean, there always are in the restaurant game. I think, you know, in Melbourne in particular, that we're still struggling with uh, not 100% or even 60% workforce back in the city. And, you know, while that affects day trade, it also does affect your night trade because, you know, you, I guess what I didn't realize is how many people come and eat after work. And if they're not there, they're going to their local, you know, wherever they might live or especially Mondays and Fridays, they, they tend to still be a bit flat, for example. Izakaya Den is a, almost a legend of the city. It's, it's, it feels like it's been there forever. Is it, is it a little bit different to sort of what you created when you first started it? Yes. Yeah, so we actually just turned 13 years old uh, about a month ago. So well, I did think it was 12 for most of the year, but then I realized that we'd sort of lost a year along the way and I had to do my calculations. Um so, yeah, I mean, when COVID came along, we did have to make some significant changes. Um, we were closed for eight months. Uh, the takeaway idea wasn't something we felt suited us or that we we felt would improve our brand. And we've always been very aware of wanting to be true to what we do. Um, and an izakaya is not the sort of place that does take away. I mean, that's just not what you do. Um, so, and the other thing is we lost all our staff. So, you know, we've always championed having Japanese staff. It's been one of the things that I think has kept us, you know, where we are, but they were all informed that they should go home and being lovely Japanese people, they did what they were told and when they went home. So we sort of were left without a business. So we, you know, obviously we went COVID, we were into hibernation and, and then when things started to look like that we were going to be able to open up again, we had to come up with another concept, a, a, a reimagining, I guess, of Izakai Den. Tell us a bit about what that is. So at that point, I was speaking to uh, an old chef of mine called Jared de Blassi, who at the time was the head chef at Izard and had been there for sort of six or seven years at the time. And he used to work for me at Verge. He came back from London and worked for me as a sous chef at Verge. And we'd, we'd maintained a relationship. And he was also one of our, if not the best, one of our best customers at Izakai Den. We would probably see him every week. 
Um, so he really knew us and knew the product and knew what we were about. And we just talked about, you know, doing relaunching and doing a bit of a, a new take on the Izakaya idea. I guess the positive thing was, you know, we did have what we felt was a really great product before, but it was 10 years old and it probably did need some refreshing. So I look at that as a real positive. So Jared came in with uh, his sous chef, Paul, and while they're not Japanese, they have a really good Japanese sensibility and a real understanding of what it's all about. Paul had been just recently at Franzen in Sweden, so which was sort of Nordic Japanese food. So... It was actually really exciting to be able to relaunch and do something fresh, but still within, you know, the confines of Izakaya Den. You've uh, had such an amazing impact on the Melbourne dining scene, but take us back to when you were young. What, what sort of role did food play in your family growing up? Look, growing up, uh, I guess restaurants were always a part of what we did. Wine was, you know, I... I met wine pretty early on. I mean, dad would always bring me up to the Yarra Valley and we would go to places like Mount Mary and Yarra Yering and Yerringberg for their open days and he'd collect his wine and I'd taste and be able to talk to those guys. Um, you know, my, my father was involved in designing restaurants. My mother worked in a restaurant and that's, that's how I got my first job in a restaurant. Um, so, you know, I started at 13 working in restaurants and so it's been, it's been a long journey and I worked for the same people f for the first sort of, uh, you know, eight years of my career and they, they really taught me a lot about just hospitality in general. I mean, uh, a group of Greek boys that owned um, a place called Cafe Neon back in the day and then the Red Eagle and then the Botanical, they were, they were the first to redevelop the Botanical. Um, and they really gave me a sense of how to look after people. Um, and I, I guess I carried that through. And, um, you know, left high school. I'd worked all through high school and went to uni. But I, I just found restaurants much more appealing to me, uh, the, the eclectic mix of people working there. And, you know, I just I got the bug, you know, the wine and the food and everything. And I sort of went from there and decided if I was going to, if I was going to make a career of it, I'd better try and make myself good at it and have the ambition to do my own things. Who's been really important through your career um, that's helped you pave a way to sort of build your own businesses? So obviously the, you know, the boys I was just talking about, there was Chris and Harry who, who sort of mentored me and took me on, took me under their wing and taught me about hospitality. There was, um, I moved to Sydney in my early twenties and I worked for Matt Moran and Pete Sullivan at uh, at Moran's when they first opened, and and Peter uh, inspired me then when I was maybe going through a bit of a flat spot, and we've maintained uh, we we're still really good friends, and I think he's you know he's a bit of a beacon for for the front of house service in Australia, and he's just infectious and and just loves what he does, um, and so he's always really inspired me. And then I was lucky enough to sort of surround myself with friends and, and peers that um, always managed to keep me going and inspire me and, and, you know, we wanted to push the standards and push high quality across Melbourne. Tell us about the um, first venue uh, that you opened and sort of what it, what it took to get it up and going. Yeah, I mean, thinking back, the beautiful thing about being in your late 20s is that you've got endless amounts of energy and you also have no fear. And I think, you know, opening a business now after being doing, having businesses for 20 years, it's a very different thing. But back then, you just nothing, nothing seems to get in your way. Um, you just you just make it happen and and you really you don't know what you're doing most of the time but it's amazing so verge was the first restaurant that I owned I'd, I'd managed and worked at Lux before that for about three years which I guess I sort of you know was my final bit of uh, education before doing my own thing um, and I opened verge with my my then partner, Michelle Bowen and Chef Karen White, and yeah, it was it was an amazing journey, and it it was an all or nothing thing, um, and we were there for about eleven years, yeah. and we can we converted that, and I started doing uh, the Japanese ideas there as well. What surprised you about running your own business, having sort of cut your teeth at um, before that? I think it's 
the level of intensity and the, the fact that you you take it everywhere with you. So, and more recently, I've gone back and helped some friends in their restaurants in the last couple of years, which has been great. But it's also given me that perspective of, you know, I was able to, you know, all care, no responsibility in a way, and go there, do a great job, care about it a lot. But then I was able to go home and, and leave it behind. When you we have your own business and you have your own restaurant, it is a 24 seven thing. Verge uh, had such an amazing impact. Do you, do you have a story or two, a fond memory um, from those times that you can share with us from that restaurant? Uh, look, a lot. I mean, I think for me, building the front of house teams, like I had probably had three or four teams over the 11 years, which were amazing, and, and seeing where those people have ended up, you know, is probably the thing I'm most proud of. Um, my my favourite customer was Brian Ferry. I remember he came in the first year, and that was just uh, I've probably never got on, gotten over that. Um, he was definitely the coolest dude that I've ever met. Um, um, but you know, there were there's there were lots of little incidents and things along the way. I mean, some of them good, you know, some of them not so good. You know, I had a bar stool thrown at me across the bar one night. Um, we had flooding. I had the the grease trap you know, overflow one time when I was about to get in the cab and go and have a nice dinner. So I spent six hours cleaning that up. So it's, there's, there's all the ups and downs. You mentioned that uh, while you had Verge, the, the Japanese influence started to come in a little bit. What, what, what triggered the, the road to Japanese cuisine? Well, growing up, it was always something in in my life. Um, both my parents did work in Japan um, and, we actually had a Japanese sculptor come and live with us for three or four years in my teens. Um, so, you know, obviously there was that influence and he became a bit like an uncle to me. Um, and then it just grew from that. I mean, it's pretty hard not to love Japanese food and culture. I don't understand anyone that can't. Um, I think they're quite strange, but they probably think I'm quite strange. Um, so it just grew, it grew and then going to Japan, you know, I think, you know, there's before Japan and after Japan because it's just such an impact and was for me. Um, and then I always had some Japanese friends and it just grew from there. And I think traveling to Japan and coming back to Australia back then, sort of 15, 20 years ago, I did feel that the Japanese venues here weren't really representative of what you would find in Japan. I found they were very conservative and I guess that was just the nature of Japanese people not feeling confident in their culture or that we would understand these things. So I guess the push that Taka, Miyuki and I wanted to make was to show something that was a bit more like you would find in Japan but still be a very Melbourne place. Take us on one of the trips that you went on in Japan and, and what you saw and experienced that influenced you so much. So I think Takamuki and I did a trip not long before we opened Den. And we, we had the site and we were working on design and we were working on things and we went, you know, I guess for – if, you know, research and development, which going to bars and restaurants sounds like a, you know, a pop out because it's pretty good to do that. But so we, we pinpointed, we, we went to a few, you know, we went to as many as Akai's as we could and we would try to talk to the owners and stuff at some point. And we got some really great feedback and lessons along the way. And I guess the thing that, we got mostly was that izakaya is about a sense of place it's a sense of spirit it doesn't matter what it is so the izakaya can be a six-seater place that just serves smoked fish and sake or it can be a big chain izakaya um, and everything in between you might walk into a place that you think is a restaurant but it's called izakaya and what's the difference there it's the spirit of the place and the spirit of the owner so there was a couple of conversations that really crystallized that idea for us and they also were like, you shouldn't be trying to do, you know, a purely Japanese thing in Melbourne. It has to be a very Melbourne place as well. That's what it's about. So we really got some wonderful lessons and, and, and insights in that trip. And obviously you see stuff that you want to, I don't know, you, that inspire you. I mean, we never want to replicate. We always want to take some inspiration and then take and make it our own idea. 
when you came back to Australia and launched um, Zakaya Den and, and you ended up having Hihu Bar as well, were there challenges in um, presenting such a sort of authentic representation of Japanese cuisine and, and dining? Look, I think I, I, I would say no in a sense because I think people embraced it and, um, you know, the ones that didn't understand wanted to understand. I think I think Melbourne in particular was ready for those things. So I think we were fortunate in that sense. Um, uh, certainly, you know, the week leading up to opening Zakaya Den, we had no idea what was going to happen. You, you have, you think you've got a great idea and concept and you think you've got all the right elements, but you really never know to open. So we can't say we were, you know, 100% confident, but once we got open, people really embraced it. And I think, you know, People have, we've been lucky that Japan, Australia, tourism has become massive in the last 15 years. So I think the advent of cheap flights between, say, Melbourne and Sydney and, and Tokyo have really added to this, this whole Japanese wave of, of businesses. And it certainly helped us in terms of people understanding what we were doing. Um, one of the things that you've influenced quite a lot in this country is um, Japanese alcoholic beverages and um, how to t match them to food. And um, tell us a bit about your sort of discoveries there and your approach with, with your venues. So again, like when we went to Japan, the, the sort of things that you drink and, you know, things like shochu and uh, obviously sake even back then wasn't something that we knew here so well. And, you know, they were, they're cultural things. You, you have them in the right environment and they're amazing and I guess that's what we wanted to try and do I mean one of the things I loved when I went to Japan was drinking beer out of a very small glass from a very big bottle and you know, cute things like that so we we pushed really hard to to get Sapporo long necks for, for the opening of Izakaya Den and back then Japanese the Japanese weren't so keen on selling you stuff they weren't confident that you could sell it. They weren't confident that it would travel so well. So we really had to push at the start and convince them that, you know, we were the right people to do this with and that, yes, it would sell. And, um, I mean, I remember we bought 50 cases of the Sapporo long necks and they were pretty concerned until we called them up about six days into Izakai Den and ordered another couple of hundred because it was just going gangbusters. Um, and this, the whole sake thing has opened up. And for me, I love sake with food. And I think, you know, we've seen that all around Australia now. In most places we'll have sake. It's a beautiful beverage. I think it, you know, it, it lends itself to, to going with all types of food. Uh, you have, uh, as we mentioned, the Izakaya Den and the new venue opening uh, open up, up upstairs. Um, what else? What else are you doing at the moment? You always seem so busy with your hands in different pies. Yeah, I try not to be. I mean, we've got the family winery, so Denton Wine, and uh, that's been taking up more of my time over the last few years, um, which is a you know a nice thing to to have to escape the city. It's an hour drive. Um, I'm up here at the moment. The sun's shining, which is nice because it's been pretty wet. But that's been a big focus of mine of mine for the past few years. Um, but and I've always thought about doing something up here at the vineyard. Uh, uh, I mean, I don't like the idea of cellar door so much, but a wine bar or something along those lines. But I've actually moved away from that in the last year, and. Uh, Every every idea that I've had and, and business I've done, there's been, uh, for want of a better term, a light bulb moment where it feels like it's all fits together and it's the right thing. But I never had that with the doing a, a venue up here, a hospitality venue, and I, I always wondered why. And I finally worked it out this year, I think. And it is because I go back to saying that I went to sort of Mount Mary and Yerringberg and Yarra Yerring when I was young, and those were the places that inspired us to do our own vineyard. And, you know, places like Bindi, which is probably my favourite winery in Australia, and none of them do anything but make wine. And I just felt like that's that's what we want to do. We just want to make the best possible wine we can. And if I put hospitality up here, it's just going to eat away at those ideas. So instead, I'll probably look at doing a, a Denton wine bar back in, in the city or uh, in a suburbs in a year or two. Um, 
you've uh, helped create career paths for people that work for you, but you've also actively worked as a mentor across the board in the industry. What, what is the art to great hospitality and, and front of house service? Look, I think it's, for me, it's probably changed over the years. I think when I was young, I was very intense and, you know, all the little details were super important to me, where the pepper, you know, grinder sat, where the salt was, what position the water glass was in. And they were the things that helped me guide myself and and keep things in control was I think lately and, and probably over the last 10 years, I've relaxed a little bit on those things and, the focus for me is just on a customer, on, on making people have a good time, letting people have a good time. Um, and I, that's what I try to instill in my staff is a relaxed nature, friendly, you know, knowledge is really important, but, you know, we don't want to be teaching, telling people, teaching people they're there to have an experience. And, you know, I think humour and fun and all those things are so much more important these days. You mentioned uh, some changes to Izakaya Den as a result of the last couple of years with the pandemic. Has has your approach to hospitality changed out of these circumstances? Look, I think it has. I think, uh, like I just touched on, what's what's important? Why do we go out to restaurants? Um, people hopefully, you know, appreciate restaurants for different reasons these days. Having been stuck at home ordering takeaway or cooking their own food for a long time. And we do, we go out for entertainment, we go out to meet people, we go out to enjoy things with our friends and family. And that's the thing that I really want to focus on. I want to make sure that everyone comes in and, and has a good time and goes away with a good experience. Well, you've uh, influenced so many people uh, over the last couple of decades with some incredible offerings. What, what do you love about what you do? Look, it, it's the people. I think that that's the thing that draws me back. It's also the thing that probably, you know, turns me away sometimes when because it is intense and you do need some time to yourself. But, you know, w- the people that I work with always has been amazing and, you know, just the, the diversity of customers, those are the things that really get me going. You know, I love the food and wine. I love the, the intensity. I love the middle of service. It's still, you know, that two hours of a night time where you're just on the edge of your seat and you're just keeping it just under control is still probably my happiest time <laughs> because that's all I'm thinking about. And I, all the other things in my life get pushed to the back of my head for that couple of hours. And I still get a lot of joy out of that. Well, Simon, it's always a joy to catch up with you and look forward to seeing uh, the wine bar uh, landing in Melbourne in the future. Um, Please keep in touch and uh, we'll catch up again soon. Great. Thanks for your time, Anthony. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Stay tuned as we take a deep dive into the lives of the incredible people who ply their trade in the food and hospitality sector. Special thanks to executive producer Rob Locke for making this all happen. Follow us on Instagram at Deep in the Weeds Podcast or email us at podcast at deepintheweeds.com.au. Stay safe and be well.